Welcome to the Bringing the Human Back to Human Resources podcast, the podcast all about the delicate balance between people and business, and quite literally, reconnecting the two. My name is Tracy Rubin, and I've spent nearly my entire professional career in HR. Join me as I share stories, opinions, and words of advice with you each week. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Thanks so much for being here for another week. If you haven't done so yet, give this podcast a five-star review wherever you're listening to this. Make sure you subscribe and connect with me on Instagram at HR Tracy. This week's episode is a guest episode, so you can watch or listen however you prefer to consume this content. And I have on the podcast this week, Steve McIntosh. He is originally from the West Coast of Scotland and is a recovering accountant, but also an HR professional. He is the author of The Employee Value Curve, The Unifying Theory of HR and Career Advancement, Helping Companies and Their People Succeed Together. Let me tell you, this book, that what, what Steve has written and theorized is really exceptional, and I'm excited for you to hear the discussion on these theories um, just in general, but I, I think it'll allow us all to think a little bit differently about the ways in which we think about people and how we quantify not only the value of people, but the value that people have on an organization. Steve began his career with the global accounting firm KPMG before founding the financial services recruitment firm CML in 2004. Steve is the founder and CEO of CareerPoint, and I just want to read for you the mission of CareerPoint. CareerPoint's mission is to help one million young professionals advance in their careers. Our international team is passionate about providing access to career development opportunities to underrepresented and disadvantaged groups. It's time to democratize coaching and we've accepted the challenge. So that's amazing, right? I mean, what a, what a mission. It, it goes to it goes without saying that Steve is a very mission-driven person and I think the value he's added to this discussion about where people are in terms of value within their organizations. This is what you'll hear today. Um, but it, it just, it, it makes sense to me that Steve has created career point based on this mission. Obviously coming from an accounting background, thinks about people and value in a way that obviously for us is qualitative and in, in that everyone presents this intrinsic value, right? But because of his accounting background, he found a way to quantify employee value, which I think is so interesting. And you've heard for a number of weeks now, this discussion around creating a business case and looking at things from a numbers perspective in order to support the qualitative pieces of your discussion. So I think you're really, really going to enjoy this discussion. For more information on Steve, you'll hear where you can connect with him at the end of the episode, but also you can absolutely go into the show notes and find uh, his links there so you can stay connected. Without further ado, here is Steve. Well, Steve McIntosh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. I'm really excited to talk about the employee value curve, which I have conveniently taken many notes on my Kindle, which yes, you can do that. I love it. Um, but thank you for thank you for joining. Oh, wow. It's great to be here. And uh, what, what an intro. I'm a huge fan of the show. Uh, uh, one of your growing number, I know. <laughs> it's an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm really excited to talk about you and what you are doing in this space, because I know I had shared this with you when we initially spoke, that the reason why I wanted to get you on the podcast in general was because of this tagline that was sent to me, which is really, and this is not verbatim, you could probably correct me, but it was basically like, if employees are the center of the company and like the highest value part of a business, why isn't the HR person the CEO? Absolutely. Yeah, I think... And I'm a zealous convert to HR, right? As you know, right. I actually began my career as an accountant. I was with KPMG for five years before I realized that HR was where it's at. And so I came to this relatively late in my career. And ever since, my eyes were opened. <laughs> and I'm I now kind it. of on a quixotic ride to tell every business owner and executive that I can that HR is the most important function in any business yeah. and all the things that come from that. 
I love it. Hey, listen, the more you tell an HR person that they're the most valuable person in the business or valuable piece of the business, I should say, the more fans you're going to get. I swear, I'm telling you, yeah. it's going to be it's going to be the thing that gets you, gets everything going. But all jokes aside, I I really love this perspective because actually it, it really underpins the the recognition that people are so critical to a business and that a business exists thanks to the work that people are doing. So I want to really spend a lot of time talking about your book, which is the employee value curve um, and the unifying theory in this. And I've taken a lot of notes and I have specific questions for you, which I know I did not prepare you ahead of time. So you are in the hot seat, as I tell all of the guests who also do not have questions given to them ahead of time. Awesome. Um, But I really would, I want to hear from you this unifying theory of HR. You said in the beginning of the book, while HR is vital to most businesses, precisely because most businesses are so reliant on their people. And it continues to say, relying on on their people to deliver the products and services that generate a return for investors. The phrase adding value is strangely absent from much of the professional HR literature, let alone front and center. When it is invoked, it can be in dangerously misleading terms. So can you break that down for us? Because I, I walked away really, um, resonating with this and also resonating from the perspective that you had shared with me initially, which is that there isn't really any type of like theory or fundamental like understanding and learnings and teachings for the HR profession. So that's kind of what I walked away understanding from that quote, but can you break it down for us a little bit more? Sure, happy to. And to start out with, there's an exercise that we do in workshops with clients, which is normally with a management group, often it's the C-suite. And I think this is kind of revealing, and it's a good place to start the conversation. So the question that we pose to them is, what percentage of your company's value comes from its people? Mm. Right? And this is a non-HR crowd, right? Right. And it's always interesting to see the the range of responses. But I can tell you, having done this many, many times over the years, because I I began having these conversations with C-suites long before I founded CareerPoint, the answer nearly always comes out to around 90%, right? And often, just that one exercise is kind of a penny drop moment for executives in a company where they're Mm -hmm. like, wow, I never really thought about that. Right. 90% right. of the value in this company comes from the people. Wow. So then we need to kind of have a discussion about what we mean by value. And this has become a, a very interesting discussion in the last few years. Right. But when I went to business school the first time around, it was a premise of centuries of corporate law that the purpose of a company was to create value for shareholders. And I think the way to think about that is that that is the default position, right? That if if no other decision has been made by the company as to what we mean by value, so in some cases, there is a different decision. And for, for example, B Corps have decided that creating value for shareholders, financial value is not their mission. Right? They've stated that in the company documents. But outside of B Corps, there is a lot of company law that talks about the importance of creating value for shareholders. And it's a discussion that, that really needs... So one of the things that uh, you might remember from the book is that I say this... It, don't take this the wrong way. This is not to impugn the HR profession or the HR department. But it, it's not the HR department's job to decide what value means. Totally. I totally right? agree. Yeah. It's kind of the, that's, that's a decision that needs to be made at the level of the board, quite possibly. And if no other decision has been made as to what value means in this company, then the default is that what we're talking about in value is financial value. It's economic value. And this kind of makes sense, right? Because 
the purpose of a company is to create value in the world. So I think people kind of get, they, they might take this the wrong way because they think, oh, this guy cares about his money. No, not the case, right? I, I recognize that very important for a company to do good things in the community. It's very important for the company to care about stakeholders because that is what leads to company success in the long term. So what we're talking about here is what is the definition of company success? Really, mm -hmm. and it's very important. It's a very important. It's a complicated discussion, but I think it's very important, and it's especially important that all of the departments in a company and all of the critical functions have the same understanding of what value means in this company. Right, and that's that was really what I was going to say too. Is that the key is that assessing value and under and creating a parameter for what value is and means is collaborative. It's not just one department or one person. Um, and and actually, on this point too, I think all of the challenges that come along with managing people and all of the challenges that come along with running a business. Um, I think it's, it is important that HR leaders realize that it's not them versus the business or them and the business. Like every single person has, and I always say this, has skin in the game. Every single leader has skin in the game to make the experience what it needs to be for an employee and also to have like these mutual uh, value uh, assessors. And we see a lot of like nine box grids and talent assessment um, platforms and things like that. But the reality is, is that those tools and innovative approaches don't replace the work that people have to do to create what that means, what value means and how you um, create an environment for top performing and high valued people. Yes. 100%. This is, not, uh, this is not a zero-sum game. Right. right. This is a win-win. Because, right. so one way to look at this is from the company's perspective to say that no company can succeed unless its employees are successful. The more successful our employees are individually, the more successful our company will become. Absolutely. Right. And so then it's a case of, okay, so if the process is that employees create value and then they capture some of that value, right? And this is kind of where I always, uh, I think it's a good thought experiment, if you like, right? And to make this personal, I know that people are going to be listening to this podcast in various different situations. I was listening to your last podcast at the gym this morning. Some of your oh, listeners great. might be driving in the car. Others might be taking a walk. <laughs> um, but I, here's a here's an interesting thought experiment to kind of make this a bit more, a bit less abstract, if you like. Right? So I'm going to ask you and your listeners to just think of a couple of numbers. Right? The first number that I want you to think of, you don't need to say it out loud. If you're playing at home, just, you know, if you're at the gym, don't start yelling out numbers randomly. Right? just in your own head. The first number is your total cost to your employer. There will be some costs within that that are very easy to think of, like salary. Most people know their salary off the top of their head. There might be other things that are less easy but still possible to put in financial terms. So you might have benefits like health insurance, 401k benefits, things like that. And you know the value roughly of those benefits. There might be other things that are even harder to put into dollar terms, like for example, uh, the training that you receive, which is a huge expense to a company, as you know. Right. Recruitment, overheads, all of these costs. So if you come up with a full, and the shorthand for this is normally, you know, 50% of salary, something of that order, right? So you have this number of your total, your fully loaded cost of the business. The second number that I want everyone to reflect on is the value that they create for the business, right? Come up with an actual number. And the reason I think this is a good thought experiment is it starts to, you can see the difficulty. And what you find yeah. is that the bigger the company you're in, the harder it is to figure out the value that you create for the company. But why is this very important? Because the value that you create 
for your employer is an upper bound to the value that you receive in return for your employment, right? Which is another way of saying that if you're fully loaded, if you want to earn $100,000, who doesn't? More, right? right? If you want to earn $100,000 and your fully loaded cost is another 50% on top of that, that's $150,000. You need to create more than that in value right. for the business to be paid at that level and to enjoy the benefits that you want because all of those costs to the business, those are benefits to you. That's what you receive, right? So this is what our coaching is all about is helping people understand how they create that value. What does it mean to create value? What are the mechanisms and the ways that you can create value? And this is not kind of, this is this is what's not been done. Uh, you know, there's there's a whole branch of economics about this. It's, it's quite boring. It's called personnel economics, but it mm -hmm. doesn't quite it doesn't quite do this, and it's very detached from human resources as a function. So right. what we've done is to kind of break this idea of value down into eight component parts, and this is another part of our standard workshops, is to work with companies and to work with groups of employees to let them brainstorm how do employees create value, and the reason is that this is another kind of aha moment for people. When you see the list of ways that you can create value as an employee, it's always the same. It's actually a very short list that you can easily get your arms around. And when you start to think about all of the ways that you can create value, it starts to open your mind to allow you to create more. Right. Well, something that stuck with me in the book was actually sort of toward the end, which is how you scale the curve and and so just to to preface for the listeners this um the you know employee value curve which we'll continue to talk about is really what you have developed to assess where each person's value is basically leveled in an organization and how it's evaluated and how each person contributing that x amount of value is placed actually theoretically on this employee value curve and how we can use this understanding of a curve to further understand the way that people bring value and how much value they bring. And so there are super top performers who are going to contribute the most value. And then there may be some substandard performers or people who are just, you know, doing exactly what they're supposed to do and they're contributing value, but maybe not as much as those super top performers. And then there are, of course, people who are not contributing value. Um, but we all know those people. There they're, will always be top performers and bottom performers, right? But something that stuck with me because I know you know, my listeners want to know what they can do to keep growing. This is, this is a podcast for the people that want to keep going. And I love that. But the thing that stood out to me here is where you say, the best way to begin looking for opportunities to increase your employee value is to leverage what you naturally do best. And I was like, yeah, that's like, that's exactly it. Like when I think about my own career and times where I've really tried to like climb the ladder fast, which probably has always been my method, you know, it's like I'm not going to start doing something that I don't really feel passionate about or that I don't feel I'm so great at just so I can get a little bit better. You focus on the things that really are strengths for you because those are the things that you're going to continue to maximize on. And there are a lot of, I'd love to hear your opinions on this, but there are a lot of um, theories out there, or I guess I should say theoretical frameworks where some people feel that employees should be um, developed based on their weaknesses or opportunities. And then there are theoretical frameworks that say, no, you should be focused on the person's strengths. I personally believe the latter is more effective because who wants to spend time focused on the things that they don't really enjoy or care much about because it's probably why there are opportunities for them. It's not to say that when you have an opportunity, like you need to communicate better, that you shouldn't work on that. You absolutely should continue to develop those things. But what are your thoughts on that, especially in this, this framework of increasing employee value and your own employee value, focusing on strengths, as the that theoretical framework yeah so there's a couple of ways that i would look at that and the starting point for me is to take as broad a view as possible of all the ways that you can create value right so i think one of the challenges is to connect your strengths to value creation for the company 
And there's an element of just what's your job within this company, right? Does your, does your role within this company allow you to use those strengths? So to give an example, if relationships is one of your strengths, if you're a great communicator, you're great at forming relationships and maintaining those relationships, that is potentially very valuable to any company. That's why salespeople are so highly valued, mm -hmm. right? But what if you're not in sales? What if you're in the mailroom, right? You really have two options. You can either figure out how someone in the mailroom can use relationships to add an enormous amount of value, which is possible but tricky, and you know, it would mainly be on things like the impact on morale in the organization because everyone knows you and everyone sees you, or you can find a different role where you can actually apply those strengths to the company's benefit and to yours. So there's a couple of different dimensions to this that I think you need to, to look at. But the, the key is that you're solving for value and not just to assume that, well, this is a real strength of mine, so therefore it creates value for the company. That's not quite how it works. It actually has to, where is the value? <laughs> if, you, yeah. if you struggle to be able to point to the value in terms of more revenue for the company or you know maybe more revenue down the line or lower cost for the company those are really the ways that ultimately uh, an employee adds economic value it has to connect to those things at some point so i think it is a good idea to focus on strengths but i think you also need to look at all of the ways that you create value so uh, uh, because mm -hmm. some of them are very often overlooked so to give an example Innovation is one of the most important ways that an employee creates value, mm -hmm. right? Ideas are, can have a value that is magnitudes more than one hour of your time. It's a, it's a fantastic way to create value for a company, and it's something that people can learn to do, and it's also something that people can obstruct. So as much as it's an opportunity for you to create value, it's also a way that you can potentially destroy it by standing in the way of yeah. So it's an important one not to overlook. And I think if you if you if you're not fully aware of all of the ways that you can create value, what can happen is to say, well, I'm fantastic at relationships, so I should just focus on that one. Mm. But actually, you might also be really good at innovation, and your relationships are very important in the innovative yeah. process, right? Because you need to bring other people along with you. You don't just have right. an idea and then it happens. There's a political process. Yeah. And so your relationships can help the process of innovation. And that's another way that you can create value. This episode is brought to you by Namely. With workforces continuing to evolve at rapid speeds, it's more important than ever to stay ahead and support the people behind your business. You need the right HR solution to do that, but making any type of switch can feel overwhelming, unless you make the switch to Namely. This is the all-in-one HR solution that your company needs, and they are backed by a team of hands-on specialists that will guide you every step of the way. Namely helps you and your team stay connected and informed on each aspect of HR, whether you have 50 or 1,000 employees. With onboarding, performance management, payroll, and intuitive benefits enrollment, all in one connected and modern platform. Plus, your team of implementation experts makes the transition to Namely painless with best practice consulting, system configuration, training, and more. And it doesn't stop at implementation. Get ongoing dedicated support and enhanced services from experts who know your business as you continue to evolve. So that way your entire team can become experts themselves with the tools and services to help them succeed. Companies are built on people. Don't let either fail. Get the support you need and learn more about making the switch to Namely today by going to Namely.com. Don't wait. That's Namely.com. That's really interesting. I like this idea too of of really understanding how your strengths can be um, con and not condensed but um, amplified, leveraging mm -hmm. other strengths. Exactly. Um, and actually, this point on innovation, I think, is really interesting because there there are so many thoughts out there and articles and things that we can, we could talk about this probably for days where people are afraid of innovation. They actually think innovation is going to take their jobs. That it's going to be the reason why they're not employed in 15 years. And actually I think it's lack of innovation that you should be afraid of. You know, it's like, if you don't innovate, if you don't 
pro- progress, that's actually going to be the reason why you potentially like don't have a place to work in 15 years. And I talked about this somewhat um, briefly on a, an episode called Don't Be the Next Blockbuster. Because yeah. actually, the, the, and this was like early in 2021, I think like 20 to 30 episodes in, um, which is that when companies don't innovate and they don't focus on progress, they will end up being like Blockbuster where they have one glorified location left because Netflix figured out how to maximize innovation and, you know, now is filling the homes of millions across the globe without really much overhead. At all. There's probably the only overhead, the only thing they're paying for is people. You know, they're really, it's not much other than an e-commerce business. And so, um, you know, when I think about this this theory on, you know, I- innovation, for example, being a strength, that's, that's you don't want innovation to be an opportunity. And then I, I also think on my last thought on this point before I ask you another question is that when employees or people, HR leaders, um, you know, pigeonhole themselves into this thinking that, you know, one strength or opportunity is going to be their success or their demise, there is a lack of progress in that too, because then that means you're not developing. And so the one specific question that I have for you in this, um, in this conversation is how does an HR leader who is told by most departments and organizations and thought leaders out there that they are not generating revenue for a business, which I don't agree with, but this is the theory out there is that HR is more of a cost center than anything else. How do they prescribe a value amount to what they're doing and what they offer a business? It's a great question. And really the the role of HR is quite similar to the role of leadership, right? Because As a leader, what you're trying to do is enable other people to maximize their value. And that is what the employee value curve is all about. Because it's a win-win. It's a win for the employee and it's a win for the company. This value that the employee creates is shared Hmm. between the company and themselves and their family and their community right so it's not a zero-sum game and i think that's the that's why this is i hope a useful framework it's a useful way to talk about it and actually what we found is that hr managers often use the employee value curve to persuade skeptics Mm. because it provides a framework that reconnects hr to value right and a simple way that you can do that is to engage a department head in the conversation to say Let's imagine that we that this curve is your team or your department, right? And all, we have all this, we have a certain amount of value. We're not going to calculate that, so don't misunderstand. This is a theoretical framework that you could think of as being a bit like the, the demand curve, right? Companies mm-hmm. don't often go out and actually draw their demand curve. It's very difficult to do, but in theory, yeah. there is a demand curve, right? It's the same thing. So. If you sit down with a head of department and say, this curve represents the value that your department is creating for the business. And there are two ways that we can move this curve up, right? Moving this curve up mm-hmm. is creating more value. It means your team is more valuable it means to the business. It means that everyone in the team is more successful. So how do we do this, right? And that's the start of a great conversation because when they see it in those terms, they're now starting to think about, well, what does it mean? What does it mean for employees to create value? How do we move? How do we help employees create more value for their benefit as much as ours? So that, and if the department head says it's not possible, well, I would disagree. But <laughs> that's maybe you should spend time with department heads who believe that it is possible and want yeah. to try to make it happen. Right. No, that's really interesting. And and I talk a lot about on the podcast and have recently spoken about this that it's important to understand and know how to build a business case and to really promote with data what it is that you believe in or want to see or want to change. And, and, you know, that innovative approach has to have something quantifiable backing it up. And 
HR leaders are not often taught that. I feel lucky that my HR leaders have taught me that, but it's really um, seldom found. And I think it's because of this antiquated idea that HR doesn't bring, you know, quantifiable value, which we already established is totally not true. Um, and so I think one walk, one takeaway that someone can have from this is that, you know, and you talk about this too, and you talk about it in the book, that there isn't really a theoretical framework for HR people and HR as an industry. And that this employee value curve, this concept and and theoretical framework in itself actually gives us that framework to develop our business cases. And so for the listeners who have been hearing me talk about this business case uh, over and over and over again for the last few weeks, I, I think it'll be important for them to understand that there are ways that you can quantify the work that you're doing. And so I guess I, I do have really probably two more questions for you. Um, but the first one that I'm thinking of is how does value increase or decrease based on environments? Like if, if someone is working for a miserable person or if someone doesn't enjoy the work that they're doing, but they're really competent, how, do, how is their value impacted? Or if they're in a really amazing environment, for example? That's a really smart question. So, and it's why one of our value drivers is business environment, right? That's one of the, val one of the value drivers that we use in, in career point coaching for that exactly that reason, because your value is to some extent a function of your environment. There's no getting away from it because you could be the hardest worker with fantastic ideas and you could be great with people, but you're in a, you, you work in a, in a small grocery store in a small town. Right. And it's just very difficult in that environment yeah. to create an unlimited amount of value. You can yeah. take exactly the same person and put them in a, in a Silicon Valley tech startup and the same person could create tens of millions of dollars of value. So your value is always a function of your business environment but on various levels. Uh, just as you said, it's, it's a function of how much the business allows you to use your strengths to create value. But the way mm. to the way to open open up that uh, landscape of opportunities to add value is to be clear about how your strengths add value. If you if you haven't if you've had an idea and haven't made a strong business case, it's likely to be rejected. And often people say, "Well, you know, they, my boss just doesn't like my ideas." But <laughs> actually, it's more often the way it was presented right. that wasn't compelling. In which case. It should be no surprise because one of your boss's jobs is normally to keep you focused on what's important to the business. Right. So I think uh, it's it's something that um, people need to think about, but also about how to make the best of the environment they're in. Because you can't just, it's not a simple case of just choosing your environment. So that it's right. not to be misunderstood. And also to work with the, that means working with the boss you have, not the boss you wish you had. Right. right. You're really solving for, uh, on some level, what your boss thinks adds value in this team, not just what you strongly yeah. believe. They also have to buy into it. Otherwise, you're working across purposes. Yeah, I just it's want so to true. Come back. I just yeah. want to come back to something that you touched on, which I think is really uh, insightful, which is this disconnect between the two, between two very important departments of the business, uh, which is finance on the one side and HR on the other. And so often... The conversation comes down to uh, HR adds value. Well, prove it. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it's this, uh, and really, uh, they need to get on this. They need to get on the same page. And I think it's there's, but they need to meet in the middle, right? It's not yeah. just a case of uh, the CFO having uh, an epiphany <laughs> all of a sudden, right. uh, but quite likely the conversation just ha isn't happening in terms that they understand, and so. My preferred solution to this, and I think this is what needs to happen for HR to take its rightful place at the boardroom table, is for finance professionals to learn more about HR, mm. like I did, right? Just mm. like I did. Send them, ask them to go do a professional qualification in HR. They can do it. It's really important, and it will give them the awareness and understanding that they need to help the company add value to its people. But equally, I think it would be great for the HR department to do some finance classes 
Why? Because it helps them speak the language that they need to be able to speak to make the most of the HR function, right? To understand yeah. what does what does something like net present value, how do you calculate? That's what the business case comes down to is this idea of net present value. This is a thing and yeah. it's not, right? And you can, it's something you could learn to calculate in a day. It's really, it's not super difficult. There's not any super difficult math, but it's, there are some principles that you need to be aware of to be able to convince someone of the very important business case for adding value through people. So interesting. I actually report into the CFO. This is the first time in my career that my boss is in finance. And it's, I mean, coupled with the reality that I work for a startup and it's tech and that's how it goes. But actually, he's also one of the first people that I've ever worked for that's so excited about the people function and about employee engagement and experience. And I, we see this a lot, at least I see it a lot on LinkedIn with polls, for example, about like, who should HR report into? Who should? And it's like, who started this trend to poll everything? But I answer them anyway. And a lot of it's like polls constantly, but I think it's the algorithm like, oh, Tracy likes to answer quiz questions. I really don't. Um, anyway, there was a question recently about who, uh, you know, who should HR report into and almost everyone said CFO or finance. And I thought that that was really interesting. And and you kind of bring this up. Um, Obviously, there's a connection there that needs to be made. And the buy in is so important. But what I think is so interesting about that is that it has there's uh, it shows me that there's a shift in understanding of value. Because when you are when when someone says that HR should sit with finance, that is because there is intrinsic value. But for um, listeners who are potentially in a function that's a little bit more removed, there there is nothing more flattering to someone in a different position than you to hear, hey, I want to learn a little bit more about what you do. Because that is like amazing, right? I couldn't yeah. agree more. And I, I think part of it as well is that I really hope that HR as a profession starts to attract people that have a different way of thinking. Mm-hmm. I think that I think that would really help. Yeah, and yeah. For some reason, this doesn't seem to have happened. So it's not it's not common for someone to start out in finance and end up in human resources. Totally. And I think it would it would really help if they if the HR profession tried harder to attract people. And the crazy thing is there are plenty of people trying to get out of the finance function because they've realized that it may pay well, but it's actually uh, quite boring compared to working <laughs> with people, right? And I, I, looking back, I feel like I really dodged a bullet mm. by escaping from something that when I look back on it now, I'm like, oh man, how did I do that for even five years? But I'm, you know, yeah, I'm I don't glad know how that you did. I found HR, but it never came up as as a topic as in my career guidance classes, which I think is yeah. goes back to our conversation about playing to your strengths, right? So I was really good at math in high school, and so people said, "Well, you should become an accountant." And that, and I could have just like my whole life just said, "Well, that's it. You know, I'm good at All math, right. so I'm an accountant." But yeah. actually, I found something else that I really lo- that I really loved and was passionate about, it was just through right. uh, exposure and chance. This is why I mean, we have to get HR leaders who don't who no longer just fall into the industry. Like I technically fell into the industry, but I said to someone recently, "Imagine if people actually just like wanted to do this." This is like the most important part of the business. It's probably the most interesting part because you're dealing with people and you're having a huge impact on their lives. You're having a huge impact on the, on the business. It's a it's a fantastic opportunity, yeah. and I I advocate for HR careers to all kinds of people. You know, yep. people with finance background, people with engineering background, people with coding backgrounds. Why? Because they'll look at it a different way, and that's a good thing. That's not a totally. bad thing. We need all this perspective. Elevate HR to its rightful place at the board. So, in terms of who HR should report to, I say we should just aspire for HR to report to the board. Uh, because that's, it. it's the CEO sees it as their main job, yeah. which I, you know we talked about before, is the case. And I think in a, in a progressive company, that's naturally how people think, right? So it's it's not that no one gets this; it's just that it kind of often hasn't filtered out into the the entire landscape. It's really, really exciting to see, and even when listeners reach out to me to tell me this, that there are people who actually want to do this 
for a living and that are going to school or or pursuing careers and jobs that get them to the next level in HR. I think it's a wonderful thing. It's obviously I love my career. It's a very rewarding career. Um, But I think this episode single handedly has destigmatized HR. And it's what it this is the mission of this podcast, not only to bring the human back, but to destigmatize HR. And I think that is the stigmas that have surrounded HR for so long are the reason why people have not necessarily pursued HR as their number one career choice, because there is this such a, a you know, basic misunderstanding of what we do day in and day out. And this, this misconception that um, we're not super helpful or impactful. And so I'm just so glad that we've been able to spend this entire time talking about how much value HR people and people in general bring to an organization. So thank you for that. And I want to close by asking you for a little prediction, if you will. Um, We do have a significant percentage of listeners who are in the Gen Z population, which is so cool because it means that they are actively considering this as a career. What is your prediction for the future of uh, HR as a career, as an industry, when you think about, you know, all of these stigmas that have existed for so long and as the, the former generation's start to age out of the workplace? Like, what do you see happening to this industry? It's a great question. It kind of ties back to your last, the discussion on your last podcast, right? Because this, this point came up there too about what I see is kind of a bifurcation in the, in the industry because you're either going to have companies who become people first mm. and they get it and they're solving for the value that their employees create to enhance their own careers, to enhance their communities, and to, to create a successful company. And you're gonna get companies that just continue to insist that HR is just a cost center. Mm-hmm. So it's it's gonna, companies are gonna go one way or the other. Right. There's a saying that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. There's another saying that you can, there's some great things along these lines, but the point is that companies tend to find the right thing eventually by default. Right, because they try things that don't work, and eventually they hit on something that works. <laughs> and yeah. if you speak to any successful CEO or business owner, it's the HR part of the business that is the part that you absolutely must get right. <laughs> There's right. no other. If it's your business isn't going to work unless you have an environment that people want to be in and can thrive in. They need to be able to see that they can achieve their career aspirations with your company or they're just going to leave and constantly replacing people is going to become your company's main activity. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and no one wants to, no one wants that. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a fulfilling conversation and I know that everyone listening is going to feel the same way. I think that you have something really, really cool happening here, not only with the concept of the employee value curve, but also just what you're bringing to this moment and this HR being something different and new and fun and breaking down all those stigmas. So thank you so much for being on the podcast and for being you. And I would love to pass you the mic to let all the listeners know where they can find you, where they can get your book and and all of the above. Sure. And uh, like we talked, I mean, that was, that that just blew me away. It made my day. I, I really <laughs> appreciate it. One thing that people need to know about me is that I don't do this for personal gain. I left a very successful job and company because this is what I wanted to do the second right. half of my career. I, I'm a passionate advocate about HR and career advancement and that's what I wanted to spend my time doing. So, you know, I It's working. Gladly, so I gladly give my book away. If anyone wants a copy, just shoot me a message on LinkedIn. You'll find me Steve McIntosh, Career Point. You can find me on LinkedIn, reach out for any purpose. I also wanted to offer anyone who's listening a free uh, coaching program that they can either use for themselves or they can use for a colleague. Uh, And I mean it, just reach out and say that you heard this on on your podcast and we'll we'll pick you up. Amazing. Oh, they're going to be excited about this. Thank you so much for for joining me this week. And I'm sure that we'll uh, connect soon and collaborate on so many more fun things. I hope so. It's been a pleasure. 